story one of a changed man and other tales by thomas hardy this librivox recording is in the public domain story one a changed man chapters five through eight chapter five casterbridge had known many military and civil episodes many happy times and times less happy and now came the time of her visitation the scourge of cholera had been laid on the suffering country and the low-lying purlieu of this ancient borough had more than their share of the infliction mixon lane in the durnover quarter and in the Mombrys parish was where the blow fell most heavily yet there was a certain mercy in its choice of a date for Mombray was the man for such an hour the spread of the epidemic was so rapid that many left the town and took lodgings in the villages and farms mr Mombray's house was close to the most infected street and he himself was occupied morn noon and night in endeavours to stamp out the plague and in alleviating the sufferings of the victims so as a matter of ordinary precaution he decided to isolate his wife somewhere away from him for a while she suggested a village by the sea near budmouth regis and lodgings were obtained for her at creston a spot divided from the casterbridge valley by a high ridge that gave it quite another atmosphere though it lay no more than six miles off thither she went while she was rusticating in this place of safety and her husband was slaving in the slums she struck up an acquaintance with a lieutenant in the umst foot a mr vanacock who was stationed with his regiment at the budmouth infantry barracks as laura frequently sat on the shelving beach watching each thin wave slide up to her and hearing without heeding its gnaw at the pebbles in its retreat he often took a walk that way the acquaintance grew and ripened her situation her history her beauty her age a year or two above his own all tended to make an impression on the young man's heart and a reckless flirtation was soon in blithe progress upon that lonely shore it was said by her detractors afterwards that she had chosen her lodging to be near this gentleman but there is reason to believe that she had never seen him till her arrival there just now casterbridge was so deeply occupied with its own sad affairs a daily burying of the dead and destruction of contaminated clothes and bedding that it had little inclination to promulgate such gossip as may have reached its ears on the pair nobody long considered laura in the tragic cloud which overhung all meanwhile on the budmouth side of the hill the very mood of men was in contrast the visitation there had been slight and much earlier and normal occupations and pastimes had been resumed mr Mombray had arranged to see laura twice a week in the open air that she might run no risk from him and having heard nothing of the faint rumour he met her as usual one dry and windy afternoon on the summit of the dividing hill near where the high road from town to town crosses the old ridgeway at right angles he waved his hand and smiled as she approached shouting to her we will keep this wall between us dear walls formed the field fences here you mustn't be endangered it won't be for long with god's help i will do as you tell me jack but you are running too much risk yourself aren't you i get little news of you but i fancy you are not more than others thus somewhat formally they talked an insulating wind beating the wall between them like a mill weir but you wanted to ask me something he added yes uh, you know we are trying in budmouth to raise some money for your sufferers and the way we have thought of is by a dramatic performance they want me to take a part his face saddened i have known so much of that sort of thing and all that accompanies it i wish you had thought of some other way she said lightly that she was afraid it was all settled you object to my taking part then of course he told her that he did not like to say he positively objected he wished they had chosen an oratorio or lecture or anything more in keeping with the necessity it was to relieve 
but said she impatiently people won't come to oratorios or lectures they will crowd to comedies and farces well i cannot dictate to budmouth how it shall earn the money it is going to give us who is getting up this performance the boys of the umps oh yes our old game replied mr Mombray. the grief of casterbridge is the excuse for their frivolity candidly dear laura i wish you wouldn't play in it but i don't forbid you to i leave the whole to your judgment the interview ended and they went their ways northward and southward time disclosed to all concerned that mrs Mombray played in the comedy as the heroine the lover's part being taken by mr vanacock chapter six thus was helped on an event which the conduct of the mutually attracted ones had been generating for some time it is unnecessary to give details the umpst foot left for bristol and this precipitated their action after a week of hesitation she agreed to leave her home at creston and meet vanacock on the ridge hard by and to accompany him to bath where he had secured lodgings for her so that she would be only about a dozen miles from his quarters accordingly on the evening chosen she laid on her dressing-table a note for her husband running thus dear jack i am unable to endure this life any longer and i have resolved to put an end to it i told you i should run away if you persisted in being a clergyman and now i am doing it one cannot help one's nature i have resolved to throw in my lot with mr vanacock and i hope rather than expect you will forgive me l then with hardly a scrap of luggage she went ascending to the ridge in the dusk of early evening almost on the very spot where her husband had stood at their last tryst she beheld the outline of vanacock who had come all the way from bristol to fetch her i don't like meeting here it is so unlucky she cried to him for god's sake let us have a place of our own go back to the milestone and i'll come on he went back to the milestone that stands on the north slope of the ridge where the old and new roads diverge and she joined him there she was taciturn and sorrowful when he asked her why she would not meet him on the top at last she inquired how they were going to travel he explained that he proposed to walk to melstock hill on the other side of casterbridge where a fly was waiting to take them by a cross-cut into the ival road and onward to that town the bristol railway was open to ival this plan they followed and walked briskly through the dull gloom till they neared casterbridge which place they avoided by turning to the right at the roman amphitheatre and bearing round to durnover cross thence the way was solitary and open across the moor to the hill whereon the ival fly awaited them i have noticed for some time she said a lurid glare over the durnover end of the town it seems to come from somewhere about mixen lane the lamps he suggested there's not a lamp as big as a rushlight in the whole lane it is where the cholera is worst by standfast corner a little beyond the cross they suddenly obtained an end view of the lane large bonfires were burning in the middle of the way with a view to purifying the air and from the wretched tenements with which the lane was lined in those days persons were bringing out bedding and clothing some were thrown into the fires the rest placed in wheelbarrows and wheeled into the moor directly in the track of the fugitives they followed on and came up to where a vast copper was set in the open air here the linen was boiled and disinfected by the light of the lantern laura discovered that her husband was standing by the copper and that it was he who unloaded the barrow and immersed its contents the night was so calm and muggy that the conversation by the copper reached her ears are there any more loads to-night there's the clothes o they that died this afternoon sir but that might bide till to-morrow for you must be tired out we'll do it at once for i can't ask anybody else to undertake it overturn that load on the grass and fetch the rest the man did so and went off with the barrow 
Mombray paused for a moment to wipe his face, and resumed his homely drudgery amid this squalid and reeking scene, pressing down and stirring the contents of the copper with what looked like an old rolling-pin. The steam therefrom, laden with death, travelled in a low trail across the meadow. Laura spoke suddenly. "'I won't go to-night, after all. He is so tired, and I must help him. I didn't know things were so bad as this.' Bannacock's arm dropped from her waist, where it had been resting as they walked. "'Will you leave?' she asked. "'I will, if you say I must. But I'd rather help, too.' There was no expostulation in his tone. Laura had gone forward. Jack, she said, I am come to help. The weary curate turned and held up the lantern. Oh, what, is it you, Laura? he asked in surprise. Why did you come into this? You had better go back. The risk is great. But I want to help you, Jack. Please let me help. I didn't come by myself. Mr. Vanacock kept me company. He will make himself useful, too, if he's not gone on. Mr. Vanacock. The young lieutenant came forward reluctantly. Mr. Mombray spoke formally to him, adding, as he resumed his labour, I thought the um's foot had gone to Bristol. We have, but I have run down again for a few things. The two newcomers began to assist. Vanacock, placing on the ground the small bag containing Laura's toilette articles that he had been carrying. The barrowman soon returned with another load, and all continued work for nearly a half hour, when a coachman came out from the shadows to the north. "'Beg pardon, sir,' he whispered to Vanacock, "'but I've waited so long on Melstock Hill that at last I drove down to the turnpike, and seeing the light here I ran on to find out what had happened.' Lieutenant Bannacock told him to wait a few minutes, and the last barrow-load was got through. Mr. Mombray stretched himself and breathed heavily, saying, "'There, we can do no more.' As if from the relaxation of effort, he seemed to be seized with violent pain. He pressed his hands to his sides and bent forward. "'Ah, I think it has got hold of me at last,' he said with difficulty. "'I must try to get home.' Let Mr. Vanacock take you back, Laura. He walked a few steps, they helping him, but was obliged to sink down on the grass. I am uh, afraid you'll have to send for a hurdle or, or shudder or something, he went on feebly, or try to get me into the barrow. But Vanacock had called to the driver of the fly, and they waited until it was brought on from the turnpike hard by. Mr. Mombray was placed therein. Laura entered with him, and they drove to his humble residence near the cross, where he was got upstairs. Vanacock stood outside by the empty fly a while, but Laura did not reappear. He thereupon entered the fly, and told the driver to take him back to Ivel. CHAPTER Seven. Mr. Mombray had overexerted himself in the relief of the suffering poor, and fell a victim, one of the last, to the pestilence which had carried off so many. Two days later he lay in his coffin. Laura was in the room below. A servant brought in some letters, and she glanced them over. One was the note from herself to Mombray, informing him that she was unable to endure life with him any longer, and was about to elope with Vanacock. Having read the letter, she took it upstairs to where the dead man was, and slipped it into his coffin. The next day she buried him. She was now free. She shut up his house at Durnover Cross, and returned to her lodgings at Creston. Soon she had a letter from Vanacock, and six weeks after her husband's death her lover came to see her. "'I forgot to give you back this, that night,' he said presently, handing her the little bag she had taken as her whole luggage when leaving. Laura received it, and absently shook it out. There fell upon the carpet her brush, comb, slippers, nightdress, and other simple necessaries for a journey. They had an intolerably ghastly look now, and she tried to cover them. "'I can now,' he said, "'ask you to belong to me legally, when a proper interval has gone, instead of as we meant.' 
there was languor in his utterance hinting at a possibility that it was perfunctorily made laura picked up her articles answering that he certainly could so ask her she was free yet not her expression either could be called an ardent response then she blinked more and more quickly and put her handkerchief to her face she was weeping violently he did not move or try to comfort her in any way what had come between them no living person they had been lovers there was now no material obstacle whatever to their union but there was the insistent shadow of that unconscious one the thin figure of him moving to and fro in front of the ghastly furnace in the gloom of durnover moor yet vannicock called upon laura when he was in the neighbourhood which was not often but in two years as if on purpose to further the marriage which everybody was expecting the umstfoot returned to budmouth regis thereupon the two could not help encountering each other at times but whether because the obstacle had been the source of the love or from a sense of error and because mrs mombray bore a less attractive look as a widow than before their feelings seemed to decline from their former incandescence to a mere tepid civility what domestic issues supervened in vannicock's further story the man in the oriel never knew but mrs mombray lived and died a widow nineteen hundred end of story one chapters five through seven